our Facebook friends, and boy, I'll tell you, the sobering reality, sometimes I come to this place at the beginning of a service, and I've just got so much built up inside that I want to share. And uh, we had a memorial service here today, and it was one of those where it was a celebration of life, and, and that's always wonderful, but we were looking at a picture board that was here, and and I was hearing all these stories from back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, of course, and then to current to date. Um, I'm looking at these pictures and every one of these photos on this board talking to Mike, uh, who had lost his wife, that uh, every one of those had a story tied to it, an in-depth story. He could tell you exactly where they were, uh, the course of events that were unfolded, and all of those things. And uh, just listening to him as he was reliving, as he's speaking, and we just we spent quite a bit of time right here, and as he just took a walk down memory lane, uh, and once again, uh, what he experienced over a 40-year period of time or so, he uh, was reliving right here in a moment, right here in the sanctuary. And uh, I was thinking about that, you know, watching his face uh, as he communicated. And, and those pictures became something that probably prior to the experience of today, they were photos that probably were very seldom looked at. Um, and uh, not that they wouldn't be appreciated or anything, but you know, life goes at such a high pace so many times uh, that we don't look at things through a lens to give us the opportunity to really embrace and enjoy. Listening to him in, in the course of life that he traveled with his wife who was uh, handicapped for many years, uh, he lived in a way, they, they spent a lot of time uh, that he's so grateful for today because if they waited for retirement um, to have any of those experiences, of course, they wouldn't be having them. So those pictures become a treasure, and now they're going to be filed away or whatever. I'm sure there's, there's going to be times that they bring great joy, and there's going to be times they bring pain. But when I was thinking about uh, the experience, watching his face and seeing um, this treasure and thinking about what that represents in our life, the things that we would put in the way maybe of of the genuine relationship that is there. And that's us in a nutshell. We let so many things rob us of, you know, really grasping the bigger picture of things. And of course, uh, our relationships are very important in, in all of those things. And uh, we want to embrace and enjoy, but we want to understand that God has something so much bigger than just the temporal here and now. Uh, that is so exciting, even in a loss, because now, now there's a reunion planned. Amen? Amen. And so, so I'm watching his face as I'm communicating. And then I was, I was just sitting right back there as Pastor Randy um, began this memorial service, and I was just watching him again, uh, sitting in his seat over here. And, uh, you know, in the midst of everything that's going on, his eyes now see, they see something very important, a treasure uh, in the photos, in the memory of the experience that's going on. But I was wondering how many people sitting that were uh, listening or those who were watching online um, had some, some things to put in check in their own lives. You know, things that you wanna just make sure that you're focused on the right things. And that's just so critically important. We get so concerned over the issues of life that we miss life. Amen? Amen. A scripture for you as we get started. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6 and following says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Well, I'll tell you what, just thinking about that. How many things we stack up and we think that our, I must have these things to be, you know, to, to have joy, peace, um, contentment, 
all of these things, and we miss something so much bigger. So much bigger. So I've, I'm loaded up with a message on my heart. I'm going to tell you, I had a hard time coming to terms with how to communicate this this week. And I'm usually not short on words. But I just felt like I want to communicate in a way that you can get it, you get your mind wrapped around it and own it right now, today. So I have a scripture we're going to lead with, and, and if you can just get your mind together with me on this, it's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, starting in verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp unto the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light within is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you will devote, you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor do they store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, a single, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall I eat or what shall I drink or what shall I wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, that's a whew, great passage of Scripture. It's a great passage of scripture and to get our minds wrapped around. You know, not all of us are on this pursuit of money, but we do get on a pursuit to fill the gaps in our life that we perceive we need something that supplies happiness. And we need to understand the reality that that's at work in us always. That's always. We're trying to put something to fill this gap. We're looking for something when it's right in front of us. You know, there was a story that I like to refer to a lot out of uh, a penitentiary. It was a story of a, a gentleman that was uh, sentenced to uh, life imprisonment. And hearing his testimony, hearing his testimony was just so powerful. And, and that individual is Charles Tex Watson. And his, uh, his story is um, he got saved in the in the penitentiary, and, and he was talking about this experience, that in his life, everything that he was uh, pursuing when he was uh, one of Charlie Manson's uh, henchmen, everything that he was pursuing was found right there, right there, and it was for free. It was hidden in plain sight. And, and that story always touches me, just seeing the difference in the face and everything that comes with the person that is truly born again, that has a relationship with Christ, and how they're able to, to grab a hold of a reality that outside of Christ you cannot understand. And tonight I just have this burden on my heart that I want to share, and I really want you to get it. 
because we miss out. We miss out all the time. We're so worried about um, God providing our needs. Well, Philippians 4, 19 says this, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God's going to supply your needs, amen? I want to tickle your thinking, though, get you, uh, your mind on this something uh, tonight that I think, boy, life-changing. I think it's life-changing. You know, on the journey of faith that we've had, uh, been blessed with in the church known as Families of Faith. The, the, the journey that we've traveled together, and there's many people that have joined us, and some that continue on the journey, some uh, move along, and, and they look for something else, uh, and they're trying to find what I believe is hidden in plain sight. Just reflecting on everything that has occurred from the first day we ever put our, our feet on this property here to where we are today, all the wonderful things that went on. I've got a scripture, and this is our scripture text that I, that I really want us to get our mind wrapped around tonight, and it's, it's going to be on in a second here because I'm going to just paint you a picture. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 44 and through 46. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything, and he bought it. Well, things hidden in plain sight, I think, a lot of times, that's a, I use that term, and I, and I see things that I've learned to see, because sometimes in our life, there's a, a crazy phenomenon that goes on, and you've probably heard it, I'm going to just try to cut into it with this thought. One man's trash is another man's what? Treasure. One man's trash is another man's treasure. And in this wonderful picture we hear here in Scripture, that the man went away, he's walking through a field, and he stumbles across a treasure. He hides it, goes and sells everything in his possession that he has to obtain that. Well, this has been an interesting journey of faith here at Families of Faith. We had our Easter egg hunt and we enjoyed that. A lot of people came out and from the earliest days, of course, on this property, there was, we used to call it the property, but you know what it was? It was a farmer's field. That's what it was. This is the Konzovich farm at one time, this property. Just under 27 acres right here. And when you think in terms of everything that was here when we came here to this property, when we came, of course, there weren't crops growing anymore. No, <laughs> there weren't no crops. When we came here, it was crazy because we found all sorts of things. Our first Easter egg hunt, as a matter of fact, that we did, we had to come through here and prepare uh, so the guests could come on the property. I remember it was a big deal. We were out here with weed whips and, and uh, chainsaws, and uh, there was trees growing up out of everywhere that was the most rugged ground you've ever experienced walking on. And there were a lot of things present that were quite undesirable, right? But it was at one time a productive farm field, and it became something else. Well, there was tall weeds. There was weeds as tall as I am. And there was rough ground, really rugged terrain. In fact, so rugged that you could get hung up on something, trip or twist an ankle very easily. And there was rocks all over the ground. And if you understand what rocks in Shanahan, Shanahan are, they're Shanahan potatoes, amen? And you know what those are? They go anywhere from you know a couple inches up to 
something that, that will break your leg, right? And they're in the ground. They're just right under the surface, the craziest thing. They're right under the surface, and they would, you know, they would present themselves when you try to get things ready uh, to bring people on to the grounds. And, of course, there's all sorts of other things that were out there. There are rodents running around. We're not real excited about those. There were rabbits running all over the place. You've seen hawks flying in. There was raccoons that were, uh, found this place home, and there was possums. There was occasional foxes on the property. There was coyotes, and, and deers were frequently seen on this property, right? We even had a, a few Satan worshipers that were set up on, on this property that uh, we had an incident with that uh, they're, they're no longer on the property, and they uh, found out that they had to take up their, dis their, uh, their grievance with the owner, and that was God. We had all the naysayers about this property, too, you know, the ones that were part of what was going on, and they really didn't uh, believe that God would do something amazing. Obstacles with the, the village, crazy obstacles that were in the way. All of this stuff was present on this field, this field. Well, we took that quite literal as we started on our journey of trying to accomplish what we believed about God. We, we had this piece of property and we began to do all sorts of things, but uh, we had to undergo some, some crazy uh, excavation and we had to deal with everything around this property that would transform it from a barren field and turn it into what we now know as Families of Faith Church and Academy. So many things. I'm just going to come down there with you guys on the floor. So many things to consider. Because, once again, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? And you begin to see things differently when you look through spiritual eyes because now you see things that were not there maybe before. I'll give you a for instance. Shanahan potatoes are a big deal. Uh, you, now we have them there surfacing. We have water main got put in on the side of our property. Compliments of Shanahan. And uh, not compliments, that's, I'll leave that alone. Anyway, there's Shanahan potatoes coming to the surface again, right? And they're not friendly to mowers, are they? But, you know, so we wouldn't say that that would be a treasure, would it be? That's not a treasure. But you know what? You know what some of those very rocks have become? This platform right here. Underneath this, this is poured in concrete, right? And in that concrete are some of those Shanahan potatoes. And on them Shanahan potatoes are the names of some people that we've prayed about for long periods of time. Some that have come to know the Lord, some that haven't, some that have got their own ideas and they're doing their own thing. But God has done an amazing things with little rocks that we used as an altar of remembrance that are right here under the surface. You can't see them, but they're here, right? So there's a treasure that's hidden, and we call them a treasure because they brought us to a place to have an altar of remembrance that that represents somebody that God loves and cares for deeply. Amen? But we don't understand that a lot of the things that are maybe hidden on the property, you don't know what they are, you don't understand the magnitude of them, and you certainly don't see them as treasure. We don't see them as something that we would say, we'll sell everything that we possess, everything that we could look at as value, we're going to let loose of that so that we can obtain the field. With, of course, hidden treasure, right? So as you're on this faith journey, and many have come, and they become treasure hunters with us because we believed when this was just property and there was weeds that were tall and that there was trees all over and that there was all these different rodents. He, and Rhonda, she's not, Rhonda's not in here. She doesn't, snakes. There were snakes out there also. They were sithering along the grounds along with, with all sorts of mice and all sorts of, you know what, skunks. Can you imagine sharing the, the uh, treasure field with those. And all these other things were here. 
And then we started to do some mining because we were looking for some treasure, right? We believed that this property wouldn't bear anything if we left it unattended, so we had to do some refining. And as we do some refining, we unearth things, right? So we unearthed, and everybody thought we were crazy back in the day because I remember when we presented to the church that we were going to start with this treasure hunt on the ball fields because we believed those fields were going to produce what God wanted to harvest. And so we started with a sports ministry, and we were out here with a tent and a weenie wagon, and we were faithfully out here, and we were cutting weeds down, and we were cutting trees, while all at the same time, we erected a pavilion, and we put in ball fields. And man, you should have heard the naysayers that arose out of the, out of the woodwork with that. They were just like, well, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We've got ball fields and we've got no church building. But they didn't realize we were on a treasure hunt. We were on a treasure hunt and some, some believe that hunt was so valuable they would sell everything they have and invest to try to accomplish something, to reach somebody that is not reachable, to, to enter a dimension that you cannot enter in another way. So we started with ball fields. And that meant all sorts of resistance. Then we had the harebrained idea. We said, boy, you know what? I, I think there's another treasure here. You can't see it. You can't see it. Do you know why? Because faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. We believe there's an academy here to be unearthed. We believe God wants us to do something that's going to shake the cages of kids that have no idea. They have no interest. They have no interest whatsoever in God at all. But they're coming here. They're coming in the door. And the next thing you, that you know that in the midst of what's going on, they find themselves. They don't realize that they're a diamond in the rough. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand. And the next thing you know, they're front of the altar. And they're calling upon the Lord. And some more treasures have been recovered. And we go on this journey and we keep moving on the journey. And God keeps giving us opportunity. But every time there's another opportunity, comes all sorts of obstacles. That is the craziest darn thing. I've used an analogy for years with our next step people. I've said, you know what? If I had 10 one carat diamonds in my hand and I took them out and threw them out into the lawn. I've used, used to say it in front of the old church building on Friar Street. And that's just a small area. It's probably 20 feet or something by, by, I don't know what it is. It's small. If I threw them out there and I went out and stomped them things into the ground where they're invisible to the eye, you can't use a metal detector, right? Because they're diamonds. But if I said you can have all of them, you can have every one of them, how many are you going home with? You know what you're going to go home with? I'm going to tell you what. All ten. You're going to go home with all ten, and you know what else you're going to go home with? Sore knees, raw fingers, dirt and grime and debris stuck under your nails. And you're going to, if you have to dig that whole stinking yard, because you know you only have to go down a, an inch or two. Because even this big fat preacher is not going to get them pushed in more than an inch. So if you unearth the entire area, you're going to have all ten. Amen? So you're going to find that treasure. But you're going to have blistered hands, dirty nails, sore knees. You're going to have a lot of things that go with that. You're going to have naysayers. They're going to say, don't you see it's getting dark? Are you kidding me? Are you going to stay? You've got three of them already. You've got three already. The other ones are lost. Don't worry about it. You've got three already. How much more? Are you greedy? You want more? Are you kidding me? But I'm quite certain if the prize is valuable enough and your knees hold out, and your fingers don't bleed too much, you're going to get all ten. And so on this journey of faith, 
when we look at the scriptures and you get vivid pictures painted for us and you realize that all these different things that get in the way of a treasure hunt, because that's what this is, because listen, we're faced with a reality. Every time a new opportunity presents itself, you've got to come to terms with, am I going to try to save my life or lose it in order that I might find it? Because the reality is this, that on this treasure hunt, selling all that you have to obtain that treasure, that's the smartest move you can make because you've removed all the obstacles. Now you don't have anything that's bidden for your attention. We don't want to hear that. It's like, preacher, what are you suggesting? I'm always suggesting we act like we have some sense. Jesus was cut, he cut to the chase with what goes on in our heart. We don't like that. Most people aren't real comfortable with, with when I come off the platform and start getting loud. But I got this message on my heart. And I, must, I, mean, I was in the office and I'm, I'm trying to unearth it. I'm trying to unearth it. And I, and I realized that everything that we experience here is unearthed by pro, the proclamation of God's word, right? And, and, and that word has to hit a human heart. And when it hits a human heart, we're, we're, we're navigating a, a road course for, for everybody. And it's God himself that is charting the course. And in this refining process, we're presented with opportunity. And when we're presented with opportunity, it always has some strings attached because there's always a tug of war with this fleshly body and the journey that God has put before us. And he says, listen, this life and the here and now, everything that you're living for, you've got to come to terms with what are you going to do with this treasure that is found in what eyes are you looking to see that treasure with? What eyes are you using to see the treasure? Are they physical eyes? You know, I started out and I talked about, you know, this don't store up treasures here on earth, but store them in heaven, right? And we get this picture of how you cannot serve two masters, right? And we conclu I concluded as we segued into where we are now, um, the seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, and thinking about what that looks like for all of these things to be added unto you is to understand that for us to lose everything in order to gain what is hidden here before you. Because each one of us comes to the table. And we're, you know, we're like, we're like treasure hunters. And the craziest thing is the Holy Spirit of God, he's the one that'll get, tip you off. You know, it's like having one of them goofy treasure hunt maps, right? And you, you enter the scene here and here you are and you're, you're trying to figure out which way is up as far as, you know, what does God want to accomplish in and through my life? And there's so many people that have so many answers as to why they don't need to be here at this treasure hunt. You hear what I'm telling you? It's evident by look around you in the sanctuary. Why? Because you have to look through a different lens to perceive a treasure. Because when you hear that for us to let go of everything in order that we would receive this treasure, that's required. Why? Because we revert back to our physical understanding. So here we are, and we have this journey that we've been traveling. We've had all sorts of things of ministries that have gone on, and there's always somebody that's going to be the naysayer that says, well, we're not interested in refining any more treasure, right? But here's the problem. This is, this is the problem, is that the Bible says that God created a work in advance for us to do. We are his handiwork, and I, I soapboxed that one to death with you guys. Try to get your mind wrapped around it. Every treasure that God has intended for us to find, he already knows them. And the question is, are we going to leave them buried in the sand? 
Are they going to be birthed with your life? Are they going to be refined with your life? Are you chasing some other treasure? You're saying, you know what? I don't like this treasure hunt field. I don't like it. You know why? Because every time I turn around, there's somebody else telling me what treasure we're already excavating. And I'd say, are, are, you, are you the great refiner that you're going to find the treasures that are here? Has God truly inspired you to a direction that would lead you to treasure that makes its way to heaven? Because you understand, every one of us who've called upon the name of Jesus Christ are a treasure that's going to heaven. You hear what I'm telling you? And then there's people that are out here in this world who so desperately need us to refine what God has entrusted to us. This place called Families of Faith. Well, I can go to this other church. You don't understand. They got this and that and the other thing going on. I can go do this. You don't understand. This, this, this. I understand it all. I get it. It's a place of surrender in our heart. It's like, listen, do I believe that I'm here, that I was called here, and that as a result of being here, God has a purpose in my life that will be refined and lived out right here? Or is it something that I just have a choice, and I say, you know what? There's, 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 certainly they're done treasure hunting here. They've got all these ministries. All these different things are going on. And... You know, I just want to go over here and do this. And it's like, where, where do you think a hidden treasure that maybe we would have just left behind would be today if we didn't refine it? I, for instance, we have an academy here, right? We have an academy here. And I remember when that treasure was refined out of the ground over on our, it was at our Friar Street building. It was birthed over there. Do you want to talk about naysayers that said, that's no treasure? You think that's a treasure? Listen, that's going to tear up the building. It's going to, it's going to cost us all sorts of things. It's going to, we don't have the workers for this. That, these kids coming at the, you know, the, the public schools are right here in Chad. There's all sorts of schools. There's no need for this. Boy, today, some of those naysayers are saying, boy, I'm grateful there's an academy here in Shanahan. Because times change. But the treasure was there when it was birthed. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It had to be refined. It had to be pulled out of the ground. And we have to come to terms with, you know, one man's, Trash is another man's treasure. And when you think in terms of what does it look like to think about all the obstacles that would be in the way, to think about what God might do on the journey of our physical journey, our spiritual journey, our emotional journey, if we perceived it as that he has a purpose in all of these things. You know, it's just mind-blowing when I think in terms of things that we've gone on a journey. We've been walking this for a very long time. And I look and I think about the day we picked up some of the rocks that are now into the concrete that's behind me, that have names of people on there, that before we ever possessed this land, God knew that they'd be in this concrete one day. That's kind of interesting. But I'm always wondering, in terms of treasure hunts, are there some creative people here right now that maybe they see something with spiritual eyes? Maybe they see something beyond the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, I come to church, I go home, I do my thing, uh, you know, I come to a Bible study or whatever, and I don't perceive that I have an active role in the treasure hunt of what God has entrusted us here. Because you know why? I don't see that because I'm looking through a physical lens, and in my physical lens, all I can see are the temporal things that are appealing to me. How does this affect my life? I think that every journey that I have, I have to take control of, and I have to be the one that says, if anything's going to happen here, I'm going to have to be the one that does it. So I'm going to have to put the scavenger hunt off to find the treasure because I'm in the midst of 
the pursuit of my own things. And I don't realize that God wants to do something so significant in our life that it consumes us. The scripture says that you cannot serve two masters, and I love that image that is there. You'll love the one and hate the other. You'll love the one and hate the other. So when you think in terms of of having this love for God that's developed on the journey, because you know what's so interesting? When you're interacting with people that God has given us an opportunity to interact from the seat that I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in a room that at one time was a field, literally. And there's somebody sitting in front of me at my desk that couldn't be there if there wasn't a desk to sit at. And everything that's happening is a direct result of a treasure being refined out of the ground. Now I tell you that because here's the deal. The individuals that would come in and have a concept of the great value that God has in each one of our lives and that he's the one that put this in motion. He created everything that we have here. He's allowing us to participate in something bigger than ourselves. All of those things are true. And when you come in with that understanding, then you see yourself as part of a bigger picture. You start to see yourself as someone that God will do something in and through your life, right? And it gets exciting. Or you can see the situation like, well, I just got done talking to that nutty preacher in there, and uh, now we can, we've done what we got to do, let's get out of here and miss everything. Because the reality of it is, all the obstacles, the things that are in our way, they're real. Nobody's denying that, you know, that there was all sorts of varmints crawling around on this property. There was spiders, too. We left them out. Miriam doesn't like those. They're all out there. But any one of those things was unable to keep us from approaching and accomplishing the very purpose of God. None of them were able to hold off what God wanted to accomplish. But in the midst of this journey, we have to come back to the reality that God wants to do something that requires us to come to a place to find what he wants to accomplish as great value, as great value, a hidden treasure. So how many of you begrudgingly get involved with the work of God and what he's doing? How many of you would say that on your treasure hunt, you're like, you know what? I started out this morning and I had clean clothes on. Now look at, I've got all dirty pants. There's dirt under my nails and my hands bleeding. I've got 10 diamonds, but I got all dirty and look at what I had to do. Do you fit into that camp? you fit into the camp that says this, that says that, okay, this this treasure hunt stuff, we've done a great deal of stuff here. Times are ugly outside. It's about time we slow down the treasure hunt thing a bit. I don't know how much more can be refined here. And you know what? Here's the crazy thing. These crazy preachers here, they think that I need to be involved at a level that I would sell my belongings and invest in what going on here I mean you know listen I heard somebody today who was visiting our building at a a funeral and the individual seen this place and thought it was a money mill it's like this is no church this is an entertainment center it's like boy sir you are so wrong this is a triage center This is a place where you come when you are so broken down and you've chased every pursuit that there is. And that the team that's here is on a constant quest to find an answer, to take you from where you're at into the reality that the best decision you can make in your life is to let go of what you perceive as value and grab on to what some would say is trash. Because the course of your life is going to look completely different. 
the journey that you're traveling is going to look completely different because it's not a pursuit of your own interest. It's not a pursuit of the things that you think gets you what you would perceive as a contentment because I've accomplished these great things. You know, God might be calling you to harvest out of the ground a treasure in somebody's life that you alone are the one that's going to speak words that changes the game for somebody. You, as an individual. It's like, well, there's many that can do this harvesting up of things, right? Let me just tell you, the reality of it is that the treasures that I'm talking about, the things that, I'm, that I perceive, I know for a fact that many perceive them as trash. Let me just be bolder than that. Most, most perceive them as trash. Did you hear that? Most. And I tell it to you because you have to understand, if that's reality, then the words that come out of my mouth might be, as I see something being excavated, if you will, something that does not exist, that God wants to have your life part of what draws that out and it becomes something amazing. God wants to do that, but you see it through the natural lens and say, that's trash. Would you take that out back? Or we can get into a place to say this. God, if you're telling me that many or most would see the treasure as trash. And how do I know that? Well, because the scripture says, wide is the road that leads to destruction and many enter therein and narrow is the other one and few find it. So I think that equals most, doesn't it? I'm not good at math, but I think that equals most, right? So when you think in terms of you know, trying to find hope in Christ, trying to find a new life. How many are just, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with all the pursuits that I've been chasing after, all these things. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm following the Lord. I'm not following the Lord. You know, it's like an emotional roller coaster because, you know, I don't understand why these things are happening in my life. I don't get all this stuff. And, and you're not seeing it as that God is doing some refining and he's doing some harvesting. He's doing some treasure hunting with your life. And if we get to the place to put great value to it, guess what happens? He's successful in what he's doing in our world because we let him, right? But we don't understand this treasure hunt. You know, it's the wise, it's the wise one that comes to the place to say this, that they would sell everything and go back. You understand, in this story, in this story, they hid the treasure again so nobody else would find it. Can you imagine if your perspective was not temporal but eternal, that you were so excited about being the one that God would use to accomplish something amazing that you would hide it in order that you could be the one that would unveil it because God showed you, right? Brother Dave used to say something all the time, and it was great. He'd be doing something, and, and he's not good at it, maybe, but he's doing it because it needs done. And I'd say, Dave, what are you doing? He'd say, I'm stealing somebody's blessing. I'm stealing somebody's blessing. This ain't my gig. I got no idea what I'm doing. But I'm stealing somebody's blessing because it needs done. He's seen a treasure. You hear what I'm telling you? He's seen a treasure unattended. He's seen an opportunity there unattended. So he's climbing the ladder. He's doing whatever because he sees a treasure of a bigger picture. It's a small part maybe as it as might be. Well, I don't even know how significant this is. What kind of a treasure is it? He messed with a thermostat uh, that kept the refrigerator, one of our refrigeration units at pantry running right. How much of a treasure? I don't know. Who, who was ministered by everything that got carried out of that chiller and got put out and that people put in boxes and that it ministered to all these different people? How many of these different people over a period of time of faithfulness? Because you know what happens? We're on a treasure hunt. We're on our knees. We're wore out. We can't see the fruit. We don't know what's going on. We start getting wore out. And you know what happens, brother? We get weary and doing. We get very weary and doing good. And we quit. 
And the scripture says, do not grow weary in doing good in the proper time. You'll reap the harvest if you don't give up. There's a treasure hunt here. There's a treasure here on this property. It's called Families of Faith Church. It's a group of people that believe that God has called our life to make a difference in this world for the cause of Christ and that there's freedom in Jesus and you cannot receive what he wants to do if you look at it through physical eyes because it can only be seen with spiritual eyes. Jesus said, you know, you're always seeing but never perceiving. You can't understand it. You don't get it. Why? Because you're on a pursuit and your pursuit is the wrong one. There's treasures laying right in front of you. They're in the eyes of little children. They're in the eyes of senior people who don't know Christ yet. They don't know Christ. And your voice is the voice that's supposed to shake their cage. But they don't want to hear some harebrained story out of your mouth that doesn't match your life. They want to see the fact that you said, I don't have anything in this whole world, anything under this sun of any value other than Jesus. Because here's the deal, you're going to take your last breath, folks. You hear me say this stuff all the time. Listen, there was a husband sitting in this chair right here today. And he's counting on a reunion in heaven. You hear what I'm telling you? That's reality today for him. That's reality. So when you start to think about what kind of things might my life be valued at, if I say yes to the Lord, if I become the treasure hunter, you hear what I'm saying? If I become the one that says, God, I want to see different. I don't want somebody to tell me. I don't want somebody to come up and say, hey, listen, there's a treasure over. You want to come in and help, you want, you want to come and help dig? Instead, instead, because your life is, is surrendered to him. It's truly surrender, not some baloney, garbage, second-rate nonsense. No, it's surrendered. It's surrendered where I say, God, I don't have any preconceived notions. I got no tricks up my sleeve. I don't care what it is. You show me, and I'm going treasure hunting. And I don't care what you're asking of me. I don't care what that means. I don't care if I lose my job. I don't care about what it is. I want it out of the way because you know what I want to do? I want to find that treasure. I don't want to leave one bit of it unattended. Why? Why? Because God himself put it in motion. That's why. We're crazy enough to believe that here. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You know, that, that one day, and I, I tell you things, and I repeat it again and again, because you know why? I'm trying to persuade you. You know why? Because you need to be persuaded. That's what we're supposed to do. That's our job, right? Our job is to persuade you. Do you understand? Somewhere at one period of time, our senior pastor drew a, a, a mark on a map, circled it, and it says the promised land. And you're sitting in it! You hear what I'm telling you? Praying about, where do you want me to serve? Where are we going? Where is that field? Where is that field? Where is that field? And you end up here. And you say, I don't know if I want to go to this church. I don't know that I like the preaching. And the music's quite different also. I don't know if I like it. Are you guys with me? At the old, at the other building, this is where I'd kick the pulpit. Because I want you to hear me. God has put something in motion. We stepped into a dimension, and it took many people. Listen took many people that would say, I'll sell everything I have. I'll do whatever it takes. Take all the stoppers out. I don't want to hear an excuse. I don't want to hear anything. I'll leave my livelihood. I'll do whatever it takes. I want to see what you're going to do here. And here we are. And we press forward, and all of hell has been unleashed on planet Earth, folks. All the obstacles that could possibly be. And I'm not talking skunks and raccoons and possums and snakes and rodents or trees that are knocked down. I'm not talking about tall weeds. I'm not talking about none of that. I'm talking about all of hell has been unleashed that wants not another treasure to be found here. And I'm telling you, we're still treasure hunting. You hear what I'm saying? 
and I believe there's some treasure that's not been found, and I believe there's some people that are walking around, and they're, they're like, well, you know what? I guess the problem is, I, you know, I, I'm on a treasure hunt, but it's for me. Yeah, it's for me. How's that working for you? Because God's got a treasure hunt. And he's the one that says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure in a field. He hid it again. And he went away and sold everything he had to buy that field. You understand that you're, you're sitting in that right now. You're sitting in that. The question is, at this part of the journey, where are you at? Where are you at? You see an opportunity right now? Do you think that maybe, just maybe, maybe on the outside of Christ, maybe you have never asked the Lord to rescue you? You never asked, Lord, you know, my life's a train wreck. It's a mess. Maybe it's moving along in a way that I perceive is great, but I don't know anything about this treasure hunt and stuff, and I don't even under, I can't even imagine. What was it, your first Easter egg hunt that was out here on this property that, you know, there was ruts that people could fall in, and there was, there was trees in the way, and we, we'd whipped a way through to make a path into an area that we hid eggs, and that was really kind of like a treasure hunt that was really legitimate because the ground was so rugged. And... I'm telling you, listen, that's real today, all these years later. But you're not alone if you don't understand the treasure, right? You're not alone because Jesus said that to the disciples, remember, with the woman at the well? When he says, you say it's three months to harvest, and I tell you, look, the fields are ripe for harvest right now. You weren't able to see it. Why? Because they were looking with temporal eyes and not spiritual eyes. The treasure was hidden in plain sight. Are you interested? Are you interested in what treasure God will unearth with your life? Or maybe you're here tonight, you don't, you've never asked Jesus to, to forgive you of your sins. You never received that, that gift of salvation by receiving that gift of eternal life through Christ, then you're one of the treasures that needs to be harvested tonight. But if you have, you've met Jesus, you know him, and you're on a journey, but boy, you're on another pursuit. It's not seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's seek first whatever the heck I can get, and we'll see how it, see how it plays out. And it's a dead end, and you don't want it no more. And I'm telling you, this is an exciting journey. You get to hang out with guys like me. I'm out of my mind for Jesus. I'm crazy about him. You know why? Because I was a mess, and he rescued me. That's it. And every now and then I go window shopping like a dumb idiot. And he quickly brings me back to a place to say, you know what, listen, did you forget there's some treasure out there? You know what, I, I, I want to blow your mind so much. You're going to you say, you know, I've looked around here so long. I've looked, all, I've, I've been through all this. There's nothing, you're not going to pull something out of nowhere for me. He's the one that makes water in the wilderness. Right? He's the one that will pop something up in front of you and you're going to be right in the middle of it. Your name's going to be on it and it's going to be a direct result of the one who called into existence this universe has called you into a place in his bigger picture. Can you believe that? All right. I heard two or three. Can you believe that? You ready to receive that? You know how you do that? You do that by by an act of your will, and I talk about that all the time, by an act of your will, you, you know, you get out of your seat. And you say, you know what? God, I don't see a single treasure out here. In fact, the ones that you've already refined, the ones you've, that have been dug up by some of these dopes here, um, they're a thistle in my side. Maybe you start by saying, God, I don't want to have that attitude. I want to have a different attitude. I want to be excited about the opportunity. When I look into the eyes of a young person in the hallways of this school, I want to be excited about the reality that they're hearing a message they would never hear out there anywhere else. Wherever you find yourself, 
Let go. Let go. Ask the Lord to do whatever you need him to do here tonight. It starts, let me just tell you, here's, here's the thing. You can sit in your seat and a lot of preachers say, you can stay right where you're at. We don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. I absolutely want to make you uncomfortable. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I want you to be completely uncomfortable. Because that's where we have a line drawn that says, my flesh loses this battle and his spirit wins. That's where change happens in your life. You hear what I'm telling you? It doesn't happen with good intentions. It doesn't happen moving along saying, well, I'm going to do it like this. No. A death to self and alive in Christ. Wherever you're at tonight, would you come as the music plays? Counselors, come on up here. As the music plays, would you respond?
Father God, we thank you for the time we've been able to spend here tonight, and I pray that, God, whatever it is that's standing in our way, that we've grabbed onto and we aren't really interested in letting go of, God, that you would allow it to fade, that it would become very pale compared to the treasure you have for us. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice and the opportunities you give us to, to press forward with a new conviction on our heart. And I pray that tonight, that that's where we're at. As we go from the doors of this place, God, and those that are watching live, oh God, I just pray that you would help each and every one of us to press forward with the reality that you have put before us the opportunity to let go of the things of this world in order to grab a hold of what you have for us. The eternal things that can make their way to heaven. The things that are going to be something that one day we look and we're so grateful for the opportunity. So Father, I pray you would bless the efforts. Give us the courage to press forward with a steadfast conviction. Let it be so. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>